Thank you, Irit, so much for your kind of words. Sorry we have to rush a bit the uh, previous speakers because uh, I committed myself to another lecture in my school prior to that. Um, my talk today, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, having me, is really about my book, The Israeli Century and the Israelization of Judaism. Um, what we hear here in this conference, for me, is very much related to what I call the old Jewish question. The old Jewish question was about people without sovereignty, people without protection, people who were basically constantly under duress, notwithstanding their accomplishments in variety or various places in the world, perhaps notwithstanding the example of the United States on which I will dwell a little bit more later. But nevertheless, the question of the Israeli century is a phenomenal question because we are in the midst of a revolutionary notion in Jewish history. This is the first time since the first temple which I address in which what informs Judaism more than anything else than the Jewish condition is rather sovereignty and not the lack of sovereignty. This also impacts on the question of anti-Semitism and all other questions which are before you here in memory, etc. Because what informs this question is more than anything else is not the Jewish conditions without sovereignty, but rather Jews with sovereignty. In that respect, we no longer have the Jewish question. We are now facing the Israeli question, albeit Jews may suffer some anti-Semitism as we heard in Europe, and etc., etc. But this is not what informs the Israeli century that I write about. The Israeli century is about a people that, as I discussed, were discussed most history and most of the time of history as a diaspora. In fact, the notion of a diaspora, if you look at all the encyclopedias in the social sciences, etc., including the Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences in America, which was the item diaspora was written by Simon Dubnov, uh, uh, of course, was referred to the Jewish people who are displaced, dispersion. Nowadays, we are talking about diasporas all over the world. It's almost a cottage industry for other nations, while the Jews themselves are assembled more and more in a sovereign state. This has not happened since the first, cent since the first temple, and we don't have much information, but certainly was not since the second temple, the Hashmonai time of the Maccabees, and of course not since the time of the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD. In that respect, for the first time in history, most of the Jews will reside in a sovereign state. And that is a phenomenon one has to take into account. In 10 years or so, by all demographics, perhaps 15 years, the majority of the Jews will reside in the state of Israel. This means that everything Jewish nowadays is defined by the state, including its culture, including its language, including religion, including collective memory, including institutions, and including legality and morality. One should not underestimate the revolution in this nature, including, of course, the revolution on Jewish ethics. When he discussed Jewish ethics in Europe of the 19th century, or what we call the liberal Jewish ethics, has nothing to do with the ethics that has propagated by the state of Israel, because sovereign ethics is very much different than what we relate as Jewish ethics, historically speaking. That also has to take into account when we discuss the Jewish condition nowadays, and when we discuss all those fights on the legal term, etc. Of course, we still have, as I said, in Israel, we are the fastest growing population in the world. I don't know if you know. Israelis make love en masse. Israelis deliver babies en masse. We are 3.2 babies for a woman, which is unprecedented in the OECD. Israelis are growing. We are now almost 9.2 million, including, of course, 2 million Arabs. But very much so, we're going to be 10 million, and by all indications, we're going to be 15 million in 15 to 20 years max, even less. This growth has tremendous repercussions, and it also has tremendous repercussions for the, for the ethos of Judaism itself, because as I suggest, there is no longer a production even of culture in Jewish culture abroad, less it's come from stemming from Israel. You just start to mention what I call Jewish, let's say, role models in the world. I will ask you a Jewish role model today in the world, you will have immediate difficulty to, un to, 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 to score Jewish role models in the world which are not related somewhat to Israel or somewhat antiquated. 
The last one, perhaps, was, of course, Elie Wiesel, who represented the Holocaust more than anything else in the United States. But nowadays, this voice of, of, of Wiesenthal and so on. But these issues are also impacted by the Israeli century and the behavior of the state of Israel more than anything else. Memory is impacted by the Israeli century. The Israeli century productivity is so overwhelming that even in the subject of the United States, with Judaism still thriving and the Jewish people still uh, uh, I would say is a huge chunk of the Jewish people, almost 40, uh, almost 42% uh, uh, or so. We are basically 14 million and almost 46% in Israel and 42% or 3% in the United States. Nevertheless, if you look at the productivity of culture in the United States, what I call Jewish culture, you'll find very much so that it's impacted by what's happening in Israel or completely detached, regularly detached, but not, main, main, but not maintaining a very strong ethnos, ethnicity, because it's very tough to maintain ethnicity in a liberal state, albeit religion is still thriving. The lack of ethnos in the United States and the propagation of liberalism has changed dramatically. The U.S. Jewry, which moved from the 1960s from 7% intermarriage to today close to 70% intermarriage. Therefore, the question you're raising is a very important one, but still one has to remember the domination of the Israeli century. The Israeli century, as I said, even manifests itself in literature. If you ask yourself, who are the big Jewish writers today in the world and what they're writing about in the United States, I'm not talking here. You will see, or in France for that matter, or in England for that matter, you'll see they will have to, it will be difficult for you to come by. And what it is is today that even the large writers, the Jewish writers in America, will refer more to the Israeli context in because the East European era or the Holocaust era, or even sort of like the, eman the emancipation era in Western Europe and the United States is now declining in terms of the cultural productivity of these communities. The fact that the Israeli question is so dominating, of course, is not something that one could foresee. It has kind of evolved in, in, a, different, in, a, in a different period. And of course, one should understand it has legacies, which are now we have to deal with, including legal legacies, as we see in the country of our own. We have a big debate now between what we call ribonut and rabbanut, which is sort of sovereignty and also rabbinical sovereignty. And this is a long, an, everyday, an everyday occurrence in this country because everything, everything is happening here. Those of you who come from England, for example, understand that the question, of course, of Israel is paramount. And as a result of that, the question of Corbyn and anti-Semitism is, of course, related to what's happening in Israel as well. The French Jewry, of course, are also in the same position. We have a total phenomenon of the Israelization of French Jewry, which has taken place for quite some time let alone in Argentina and other places which have traveled the world. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. The fact is that diaspora, therefore, which has been instructing us for so long, is now becoming second base for us. What is becoming the first base for analysis is becoming our issue, of course, of sovereignty. Because I cannot chart you all my thinking about it, and my book deals with this from the first temple on, how it evolved and how it was evolved. It's a really fascinating phenomenon, including our last speaker related to German questions. And if you look at the German question, which are quite phenomenal in the, in the time of the Congress of Vienna, in the Congress of Vienna, when Metternich and Humboldt are trying to defend the Jews, the small state, of course, of Hesse and others are coming and introducing an, a new twist in the analysis of the Congress of Vienna to make the Jews still outsiders to the game. And even after emancipation, which took place, of course, in Europe, and un until, until emancipation took place of Europe, the Jewish people were known mainly as people of the book. That's where they known. Am Israel noda betorato es Saad Yagaon Wupirut. This was only until the 19th century. When everything opened up, many concepts of diaspora Jewry emerged including Reform Judaism, including Autonomism, including the Bundists, etc., etc. Sovereignty was only one aspect of this notion. Nowadays, I argue, you don't see any more a thesis about Jewish life abroad, which is outside the, the, the terrain of sovereignty. And that is an, an, a very interesting phenomenon. It doesn't mean that you don't have this, the Reform movement. 
The reform movement, which in 1885, in the Pittsburgh Agreement, designated itself as a non-national theology, non-national theology, now in 1999, in the new agreement, is saying that Zionism is our paramount number one feature. So all the religious denomination, which we in Israel perhaps trying to deny, are looking at us as the key factor. When you speak to Rabbi Mervis in London, and I spoke to Rabbi Mervis and all the rabbis, and you see that all the Jewish rabbis in England were all, without any exception, were trained in Jerusalem. This has tremendous repercussion. This has tremendous repercussion. So what we have, basically, is a very big issue here that also relates to legality, morality, and ethics. I look at this at length in my book, in a chapter called sort of Jewish Ethics and Legality from Antiquity to Modernity. I will not bore you to death right now because time is short. But I want to say one word about it which I think is important for this conference. While all the other discussions about Jewish ethics and morality were discussed without sovereignty, the fact that we in Israel live in what I call the morality of sovereignty changed the whole issue of what Jewish morality is all about. Who defines Jewish morality? Who defines Jewish morality? Is it our weakness or is it our strength? Morality decision making in Israel is based on the notion that the era of chaos, the era of chaos in which the Jews will wake up one morning and everything will turn over them is over. We no longer live in a paradigm of exile and collapse even though it's in the minds and hearts of some people. Maybe we live and maybe the third temple will collapse. But the possibility of the Jewish paradigm, which began in Babylon, when the people went to Babylon and where they will be restored by Cyrus, even though we have Cyrus today as well. Remember the, when, when, when we have Donald Trump recognizing the embassy in Jerusalem, Netanyahu calls him Cyrus. Truman himself saw him Cyrus when he recognized the state of Israel. He said, I am Cyrus. So we still use this terminology. But we have the ethos in Israel that we will defend ourselves, and this is will We take our fortune in our own hands. This is the legacy of the state. Therefore, no other question of morality will interrupt us to do so. We will do everything needed to protect our sovereignty. What it means, everything needed? Everything needed. Are you going to be the first to introduce? We have to ask the question because we have a policy, nuclear policy. We don't say we'll be the first to introduce, but we certainly say we will never be the second to do so. <laughs> this is Jewish morality in sovereign times, while Jewish morality in other times was all about informed by the lack of power. Morality without the lack of power create a defensive morality. This is now also the case of the rivalry we often find between us and American Jewry and liberal Judaism. What we find is that people who are sometimes feel a little bit, we, we heard from Mr. Kozlovsky or whatever, someone spoke about it, uh, uh, Mr. Gautier said that Israelis are criticizing and so on. You know, when you have six, 10, 20,000 people on the Gaza border, on day-to-day, -day, Friday level, right? What do you do? Do you shoot them? You don't shoot them? The Israeli state shoot them. We shoot them to protect our sovereignty. And we shoot them in the Golan Heights to protect our sovereignty. And we don't ask question. This is also why the Israelis don't ask the question that this organization asks about anti-Semitism. Israelis are less concerned about anti-Semitism than the people who are in the diaspora. But for, for good reason, one can argue. They feel secure. There was a thesis out there by liberal Jews Seleskin's book, those of you who read Seleskin's book, The Jewish Century, which made the point that this, the Jewish century or the 20th century is the great success of American Jews. American Jews who found a homeland, the Golden Medina. They basically invented America. The person who invented the whole idea of the melting pot, I don't know if you know, was of course Srulik Zangvil, the Zionist. He wrote the play, The Melting Pot, and Roosevelt clapped hands. The whole idea of, of, of pluralism in America, Horace Kellen and so on, were Jews. They were trying to create America in their own image in order to integrate. In Israel, what we have is, of course, debates about the tribes of Israel. But we talk about them in the context of how do we protect our sovereignty. 
American Jews were supposed to be a, 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 this most successful Jewry. They were the most flexible, as Seleskin talks about them. They were the Mercurians. They were the one who could move back and forth. And they also find a secure homeland. For us to see what happened in Pittsburgh or in California or in Panama, whatever, we are shocked perhaps. But they are even shocked more in that respect. For us is the idea that this success of the American Jewry perhaps bringing also to his, its disintegration. The fact that you are so integrated also means that it's very tough for you to maintain your boundaries. And therefore the very issue of assimilation, 70% intermarriages and so on. Interesting enough, the Israelis were portrayed as those who are very local, quite primitive in their locality. They are the people who are dwelling in the land. They cannot think afresh about the world. And my, I make the point that the more global they are, the more successful they are because they know they have a home to come back to. We used to worry in Israel about those who are leaving us. Ayordim. We no longer talk in these terms. We have tens of thousands abroad, even though we, we don't talk about just brain, brain drain. We talk about brain gain. They go abroad and they become ambassadors. You look at Palo Alto. You see, I travel the world all the time. You look at the IC next week, I'm traveling to, to the IC uh, a co conference in Miami. And you see all those Israelis, but they have a home and they have a fight about our home. There is in Israel a fight about our home. Those of you who fly Elal, you know there's always, when they land, they said, Achi babayit ba'olam. This is the place you feel at home. Israelis feel at home and everybody has a claim about the home. And therefore you see all those migrations that are coming. We have a huge fight over the nature of our home. We have a huge fight about the nature of our morality in the home. But we are basically disengaged ourselves from the conversion, from the conversation of the universal, the universal morality in many ways. American Jews deal with quest, the question of how to interact with the multicultural society, how to have an interface dialogue. I come from Georgetown, I can tell you. All this verbosity about interface dialogue every time there is a demonstration, what we do. And you go to the Hillel and you don't go to the Hillel and how much you maintain. Israelis travel abroad. Israelis who serve in the army are big travelers abroad. They go to Bet Chabad, they go to places. They don't deal with these issues. They come with a certain security in them. And therefore, they have this kind of like a sense of belonging that the diaspora lacks and don't ask the same question. Perhaps the first time they meet anti-Semitism, conceptually speaking, and when they are abroad. Including, of course, the BDS, which is a completely different story in terms of the, what I call the old anti-Semitism and the new anti-Semitism. One may argue that the BDS is an extension of the old anti-Semitism because it's about singling Israel as sort of like the pariah nation as it used to be singling the Jews as a pariah people. Of course it is, but one should not underestimate the power of this state. This is a very powerful state. Netanyahu constantly used the word empire. You know, I, I, I wrote about Netanyahu because there is an empire and then we are hysterical. We are a hysterical empire. In Hebrew, it sounds better. Imperia and hysteria. We move between imperia and hysteria constantly because this is our nature. Because we still carry with us also the notion that everything can collapse on us overnight. So I will say here in this conference, of course, these are very important causes to fight. These are very important causes to fight and they are also built on the legitimation. Israel built on double legitimation, one has to understand. On the one hand, we want to secure our sovereignty with lots of issues that are not so much, I would say, they're not, they're not, they're not nice issues. We have Jews and Arabs, what we do, we have religious ultra-Orthodox, we have issues of gays, etc. all of these issues. But we also built on the legitimacy of the, of the powerless Jew. As much as powerful we are, we still built on the issue of the powerlessness. How do you reconcile such power and such powerlessness in terms of, of, of the legacy of the, of the state. To one extent, we can claim ourselves to be such an empire, ethically speaking, while at the same time claiming ourselves so vulnerable. This notion of vulnerability and helplessness is very much an issue in the Israeli legacy. Many people in Israel create an arrogance of power. One should not underestimate the arrogance of power. Many people also debunk the, universal, the universalization of Judaism abroad. We have a very important fact, sect in Israel, I would say, uh, uh, a very large chunk of the Israeli population who don't care in that respect. And I, I put it bluntly on the issue of anti-Semitism abroad as we are in this conference. They said, you know, let them come here. 
They, that's the way they discuss it. And I, 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 I go through this because for them, we can never be powerless. We are powerful. We exhibit powerfulness. So what we have, in fact, is a transformation of Jewish history, which I say didn't exist from the time of the Babylonian exile. The Babylonian exile created Judaism in a different phase. In the, in the land of Judea, in the land of Judea, the definition was Zera Israel, the seed of Israel. In Babylon, we started to talk about Zera Akodesh, the seed of holiness. We transformed sovereignty into religion. Religion became the core of our definition abroad. And this religion, even after we came back, and many people thought that we came back to sovereignty, we did not. Ezra and Nehemiah came back to an autonomous place. Later on, we established for 80 years sovereignty in, in the Maccabees. But the idea of Zerah Kodesh, the people of the book, the people of that, was very much dominating Judaism for, for ages. This is what kind of defined us. We are the people of the book because the book held us together. It had to hold the tribe. Jews are tribe in that respect. In modernity, we moved into the era of universalism. And Jews wanted to be universal all over the place. They wanted to be universal as nationalists in Germany, like Hermann Cohen and Rosenzweig. They wanted to be universal as they led the communists and the socialists all over the world. Socialists and communists were very much identified with them. They wanted to be led by sort of the liberalism, and Jews were propagated of that. In Israel, all of these issues are still resonating, but we are very much sovereign in our life. Therefore, what you have, the Israelization of Judaism, what I call, of nationalism. And many people, including in Eastern Europe, in Hungary, in Poland, and so on, looking at us and looking how this nationalism resonates and less the liberalism, and are looking and saying, what happened to the Jews? So also American Jews. When Beinart writes, I will check my Zionism at the door of liberalism, what he means, if Israel become too particularistic, I will not be able to be Zionist. And then he wakes up one morning, as he did recently, and there was an, an, an anti-Semitic attack in America and said, wow, my grandmother always told me that even in America, one day it will turn on us. We always had Tor Azav. We had kind of like the golden era in our life, in Spain, in other places. And this golden era turned on us in a second. Nowadays, the, the legacy of Israel, that nothing like that can happen again. We fight amongst ourselves on issue of religion and state between the two poles of Zera Kodesh and Zera Israel. You look at Tel Aviv this weekend, buses are running and the rabbis are yelling. What's new? You know, I once met a British philosopher who told me he always knew what the cogito ergo sum. I think therefore I am. I said yes, and what did you discover? He said I had two Israeli students. And said, he said, there is a universal cogito, I think therefore I am, and an Israeli cogito, I think therefore you are wrong. <laughs> so indeed in Israel we have many voices that constantly allude to the fact that we have tribal fights. What hold the tribal fights together is the question of sovereignty and security and the feeling that this is a home we have to protect. My final note is, if this is a, fo if this is a, a home we have to protect, we have to understand that under these circumstances, when we have tribes in Israel, when we have various interpretation of what sovereignty means, and we have different perspective on what Massianism means, because Massianism was always part of the Jewish paradigm, when we will get there. When we will get there, that was a big question. You know, for the ultra-Orthodox, we should have never got there, because it's only in God's hands. For the Zionist, it was not, it's because of the belief in God that we didn't get there. Therefore, we have to abandon God and start to move and take our, our fortune in our hand. Religious Zionists took the idea that we have to take our fortune in our hand, but when we do so, we do so as God basically wants us to do. This is Rabbi Cook. We have to reconcile all of these differences, or we have to do it also in the legal system. The legal system in Israel is important to us, is critical to us, not only in the national scene, but also in our midst. And attacking it or thinking that it doesn't function for us, as Rabbi Druckmann said today, is absolutely eroding our mamlachtiyut, our stateness. And this is an issue one has to discuss. Not because of just Netanyahu's files or Netanyahu's uh, indictments, whatever, which is a, you know, a drama in Israel because in Israel, you know, the language of corruption prevails all the time. 
We are constantly going from one scandal to another, after all. But this, it's because this is what binds us, legality after all. The fact that we are people of the rule of law, we have Arabs in our midst, we have Christians, we have Jews, we have Muslims. People understand the boundaries of this. And if we will not understand the boundaries of legality, we will not be able also to speak the boundaries of international legality, I argue. Therefore, we have a mission to accomplish, and I think your organization has to do its job to understand that there is a nexus between your fights abroad and our desire to form a sovereign state that as much as a particular Jewish state also have to be also a state of the Rechstadt, of the rule of law. How do you do so? It's not an easy task, but I think this is what it's all about. And the Israeli century discuss exactly these issues of how to come into a much safer future for this place on all of these domains. I thank you. I will have to leave soon, but that's life. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I left four minutes for questions, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, but what I, I want to ask, there, there, is an okay. there is an idea. There is an idea that maybe the best situation for the Jewish people is to have a strong Israel and a strong diaspora. In other words, not have all our eggs in one basket, so to speak. Okay, especially since one day might Israel might be too small to hold all the Jews. Okay, for that practical reason. Could, could you just relate to that? This is a brilliant question. I'll tell you a story here. I was lecturing on the book maybe three weeks ago, um, in the INSS, which is the really Strategic um, Institute here just around the corner. And next to me was sitting uh, the head of the, uh, we have here a former head of the INSS. And next to me was sitting um, former uh, intelligent head, Zamir. And he asked me the same question. You know, Zamir had this very troubled time during the Yom Kippur War. And he said, Yossi, I love your book, but is the Jews not always kind of prevail because they were able to be dispersed? And God forbid something happened here, they will remain there. I said, first of all, they were not so successful. They were not so successful. The idea that they somewhere to an explosion here, we saw during the Holocaust, they were not so successful. In fact, calamity hit them big time. So I don't buy it. Secondly, I don't buy the idea that Israel is uh, a place where you can destroy and destroy all the Jews, as he makes the point. The Iranian threat. I, I take all the threat very seriously, but it's clear that this is the first time in Jewish ethos that we never had that, not in the first temple, certainly not in the Hashmonai period, that we have tremendous power. This is a country of tremendous power. And therefore, the idea of obliterating the state of Israel, which sits on our souls, is of course an issue, but you basically obliterate the world. In that respect, we are in a different position. Now, to what extent we should coexist with the diaspora? Of course, all nations coexist. I advise the Indian people, I go to India soon, I advise the Armenians with their diaspora, which is much stronger than Armenia, you know, they negotiate, they renegotiate the, the, map, the, the, the legacy of Armenia, because Armenians abroad remember their Holocaust. The Armenians at home, their Petrosian and Korcherian didn't want to remember it, but they had to because they give money to, to Yerevan. Uh, the Greek diaspora is very important now. If you travel to Greece, and I, and, and I, I do so as well, I'm now involved in the reshaping of the, uh, the, of the Jewish Museum in, in, in Athens, you see that they want to bring their diaspora back. Many people took from us the question of diaspora. The Mexican government, the Mexican government opened 40 consulates in America in order to entice Mexican in the era of NAFTA. They borrow diaspora from us. What's fascinating to me is just as other employ diaspora, we become much more sovereign. Just as others understood kind of like this tool of a diaspora, especially the American Jewish lobby, APAC, AJC, and et cetera, et cetera. These are important vehicles for us. They also understand that sovereignty is much more significant for us. Whether this will hamper us, whether we will not be able to use it as a strategic alliance as we always defined it. We define the diaspora as a strategic ally. This is a big question. Because the diaspora itself, you know now, we see the, the, uh, the rivalry between the Democrats and the Republicans on the Hill, etc. We see what happened with anti-Semitism. Israelis who hailed Trump as the champion of Israel. Trump himself said that if he would be elected in Israel, 98%, remember he said that. I don't know what he said this morning, but it was 98% lately. 
uh, when we kind of like uh, 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 speak about our love of Trump, many Jews Americans see Trump perhaps as someone who is uh, uh, propagating the alt-right. And we have this difficulty. I remember once talking to Abe Foxman, and I said, you know, I said to Abe Foxman, how could you be so and you know, like in love with the evangelicals, you know, maybe they want to convert us in the end of the day. He said, Yossi, when we get to the end of the day, we will renegotiate. <laughs> we always renegotiate these issues, but sovereignty, we don't renegotiate. This is our, and so I, I take your point. I don't take it lightly. It's important for us in Europe, etc. but you know very well. Who would have thought what happened right now to British Jewry? Who would have imagined that? Who could have imagined what happened now with Corbyn and British Jewry? Who could have imagined what happened to French Jewry in that respect after the Vichy era? The Vichy era was supposed kind of like to be fading away. When I talked to uh, 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 Dominique Schnapper, the daughter of Ramon Aron, and she said, no more a Jewish question, we have an Islamic question. So we have a question of Bataclan, we have a question of Toulouse, we have all of these questions, but they are in the context of France. Pierre Birenbaum, I must say, you know, the number one is, 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 uh, uh, sociologist in France, just wrote a big piece on Forward magazine. I'm, I'm glad he, he said that my thesis is the only thesis that works for France. They wake up in the morning, they read the Aritz. They read what happened in Israel. This is what, this is what the reference point. Even if they make Aliyah, it's Boeing Aliyah, maybe one foot here, one foot there. But there is no longer a thesis about Jews in France. I don't see a thesis about Brit Jews in Britain. What happened, of course, when, 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 we, when we had the Jews returning to Britain uh, uh, in the time of Cromwell. And I deal with this issue, how they devolved. So this is, that's what makes the difference. Let alone in Germany when we heard, which is kind of a symbolic Jewry, 120,000. We don't take it lightly. But it, what happened to Judaism happened here, and including in legality and morality. OK, thank you so much. <laughs>